What's your problem with the anti cyberbullying bill? You like cyberbullies? You stand with the cyberbullies? <laughs> Are you a cyberbully? Well, it's not a cyberbullying bill, is the problem. I would say that. Uh, cyberbullying just isn't something that we should necessarily be legislating. I mean, there's no need to legislate people being mean to each other. There's there's all kinds of ways that we can respond to that, uh, but it's not necessarily something that should be criminalized. And what I have a problem with is using a term like cyberbullying to describe something that, you know, uh, ostensibly this bill is actually trying to criminalize, which is sharing intimate images of someone without their consent. So it's actually targeting this so-called revenge porn. Exactly. Guys, mostly guys, who are taking pictures of their exes yep. or whatnot and, 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 you know, I guess it's called revenge porn. It doesn't have to be revenge. Some of these guys are just boasting. I exactly. I mean, and revenge porn is really just the co colloquial term. Like, a lot of the time, uh, it is it is sort of a boasting or, a, you know, a chest-beating kind of exercise for guys. And, I mean, as we saw in the case with Rutea Parsons, for example, she was actually being sexually assaulted by these guys, and then they, they took a picture to sort of as, as a trophy of, uh, of that exercise. Right. So your problem is not that, that, you, that you're wanting to defend the cyberbullies. It's that bullying is just this, like, what's next? A no haters bill. Yeah. Or, uh, like, <laughs> totally. like if, if it's if somebody's being sexually assaulted, that's a crime. If somebody's being harassed, that's a crime. If somebody's sharing sexual photos of uh, somebody without their permission, then that should be a crime. And yeah. I, I guess that's the part of this that is beneficial is that we don't actually because they keep charging kids for child porn because uh, they don't have anything else to charge them with. Exactly, and that is dangerous. That's a really slippery slope because, um, well, that could lead us potentially in a direction where uh, kids engaging in consensual uh, image capture and sharing with one another could ultimately become criminalized when the parents find out about it and say, oh, I can't believe you did this. We're going to charge this other person with child pornography. You know, it's it's got a lot of uh, scary implications if we keep using this law as a way to prosecute this kind of behavior. Um, but, I can, but I can identify with parents who are choosing to do that because they don't really have other legislative tools at their disposal. It, it, it is a gap in our current legislation. You know, you can get charged with child porn for pictures of yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, child pornography is really not a suitable law to address this issue. Right, but it's in the news, cyberbullying. Everybody's on cyberbully panic. I mean, you, you bring up Amanda Todd. This was a case where somebody took screen grabs of nude pictures of her and then mm -hmm. blackmailed her with them. I mean, that seems to be like... Extortion. That's extortion. There's, there's all kinds of harassment charges that could be led. That's not the case where, oh, there ought to be a law. There was a law. That's a case where somebody got away with it. Yeah, a lot of the problem here is a lack of, uh, a lack of education and a lack of perspective among the people who are actually enforcing the law. I, there, we really have a tendency to blame uh, the person who allowed themselves to be naked in any situation and allowed themselves to have a photo taken. We as a society are much more comfortable blaming the person who consented to an image being captured in the first place under very specific circumstances, yeah. wherein the expectation was obviously that this was for the other person's private use. So s since this minor, uh, you know, t took her top off for one person on the internet, clearly she was also consenting to have that sent to everybody in her high school and exactly. follow her from high school to high school. It's funny because the revenge porn component of Bill C-13, the cyberbullying bill, the revenge porn component is actually not bad. It's got some issues that I think could be worked out at the committee stage, but, you know, it's a good start. Let me ask you about one of those issues. Of course... It seems like a no-brainer that it should be illegal to share if I take a picture of somebody, even if they consented to me taking the picture, unless mm -hmm. they consent to me publishing the picture, posting the right. picture, sharing the picture. If I do that, it's a huge invasion of privacy. Mm -hmm. I got no problem with making that illegal. Right. The law also makes it illegal for other people to share those photos without figuring out whether or not the subject of the photo gave consent. Right. How, how are you supposed to know... If you're on the internet sharing pornography, as we love to do, yep. is it now your responsibility to find out if all the people in the material have given consent? Well, and, and that, that is exactly one of the problems with the bill. The initial person who shared it may have known that the subject didn't consent, but the many people who shared it afterward wouldn't necessarily know that. I do think that the bill would be better off designed to address people who specifically know that consent was not a factor in the image capture and are choosing to share it anyway. Mm -hmm. But that's not all that this law addresses. Oh, no. This law addresses a lot, a lot, a lot of things that our current federal government has been looking to address for some time now. Most of the criticisms of this bill have centered around the fact that really it seems to be using the revenge porn issue as a kind of front to usher in these uh, lawful access regulations that, uh, that the federal government tried to implement uh, a while ago with Bill C-30. This is lawful access repackaged. Basically, there have been some small changes to it. So, um, lawful access, as it was uh, as it was defined in Bill C30, uh, 
Internet service providers were compelled to provide information about Internet users if law enforcement requested it without a warrant. So the old version of the bill compelled ISPs to do that. This version doesn't compel them to. However, um, it removes any liability for them if they choose to, if they volunteer to share that information with uh, law enforcement. Which we know they already do, and this just provides further legal cover for them to do so. Exactly. I mean, it, it really gives them the sense that they can do that with impunity. and. Um, um, perhaps more importantly, it gives Canadian citizens uh, the idea that if you know that ISPs can do that with impunity, it's sort of a chilling effect where you're going to be uh, where you're you're going to be very careful about everything because you know that your ISP could share it with the police. And so. not specifically in the case of you being accused of cyberbullying or of revenge porn. In any case. In any case. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. This is a surveillance bill. Absolutely. Yeah. Do they think we're stupid? I mean, I remember with the uh, with the first time they trotted out lawful access, they called it the uh, Protecting Canadians from Online Predators Act. Right. It was the anti child porn bill. So yep. now the anti child porn bill is the anti cyberbullying bill. Exactly. And it was only when Vic Taves shit the bed and said, "You either stand with us or you stand with the child pornographers." The yep. Canadian said, "What? That's yep. crazy!" Exactly. And then we had a huge online backlash that killed lawful access the first time it came mm -hmm. around. Yeah, and then and then this time, I mean, it's sad to think that we might need a, you know, an MP or a minister to say something so politically suicidal in order to incense Canadians enough that they're actually going to do something about this issue. I mean. I've seen a lot of media coverage of this bill, and the media coverage is almost uniformly uh, very critical of the bill. They're not fooling anyone amongst the people who, who just look at the two pieces of legislation, see the similarities, and say, we see what you're doing, you're smuggling in your old legislation yeah. under this no child, no, no cyber bullies. Uh, they're not fooling anyone whose job it is to parse this stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but I have seen no discussion of this bill on social media. And I think um, I think they were very smart to bring it in at the time that they did because, okay, A, cyberbullying, they're riding the zeitgeist. This is a huge buzzword right now. Uh, everyone's trying to do something about cyberbullying, so this is a way to show, you know, oh, look, we're doing something about it. I mean, I remember when Stephen Harper was first talking about this, he said the same thing that you did, which is, like, why are we using the word bullying to describe activities that have to do with, you know, possibly assault and rape and, and privacy violations. And then he changed his tune and said, oh yeah, cyberbullying is a really big deal. And by the way, here's some other stuff that we can take care of at the same time. I see this, the word cyberbullying and its application in this context. I mean, that's more of a marketing move than anything, right? It, it infantilizes a little bit. You know, it implies that the, that the people involved are, are children. And quite a lot of the time, that's not the case. So uh, the use of the word cyberbullying here, it was really just a way of packaging and selling the act in terms that would... Uh, that would make a lot of people wring their hands and say, oh yes, we need this.